okay so my slides are moving and am i i am fully audible please confirm one last time my slides are moving and i am fully audible okay great so yes now we will start uh, good morning uh, students uh, welcome to this uh, morning second lecture i am sorry it has to be a cramped schedule uh, after the morning class uh, i could not take my class yesterday because of the sent up exam and uh, you might be fatigued a little bit but i won't take too much time it's not a very i've not made a very tough lecture and uh, the good part is that whatever i'm going to show you i have about 20 slides whatever i'm going to show you is not from any book it's not from any slide share anything i have made the entire this thing based upon my own experience and the points which i thought are very important practical points since it is a clinical class okay uh so now the topic was clinical approach to a patient of anemia now notice i have highlighted the clinical and the patient part in red okay so what we are going to talk about is the clinical approach and how to approach a patient now we will not be approaching the investigations like traditionally it is given in your books or in algorithms Okay, if it is microcytic, hypochromic, if it is hypoproliferative or hyperproliferative. Uh, so the way I have structured it is that what to do when you are faced with the patient in front of you in the OPD or in the emergency or elsewhere. Okay, so this is going to be a very very clinical kind of lecture. So the outline of our discussion today will be the broad principles. of the approach to a clinical uh, case what is a syndromic approach which can be very very useful to you when you look at a patient then uh, among the investigations a very um, uh, difficult investigation is to do a bone marrow and i'll tell you when to do a bone marrow exam then what are the broad principles of treatment and finally the pearls and pitfalls in anemia lastly i have two case vignettes for you okay so first of all what is anemia anemia is just like fever just like pain it is not a disease it is not a symptom it is a sign a pointer okay it will tell you in which direction to go and uh, what to look for but certainly it is not a disease it is just a sign so what are the broad principles when we approach anemia it is not just a hematological disorder okay it is uh, it is just like fever fever is nothing fever doesn't mean anything fever means something is wrong in the body similarly anemia means something is wrong in the body and the body is telling us and we have to look for it okay a number of diseases can manifest like anemia and uh, it is our we have to find out what is the exact cause so that we can treat it then another very important principle is that blood transfusion is not the answer in cases of severe anemia or recurrent anemia patient may come to you because mostly these people have these patients have chronic long standing anemias and their body has adapted by way of Uh, increase blood volume increase cardiac output the oxygen dissociation curve will shift to the uh, right uh, so the body will have adapted to the low hemoglobin state so it will not be a life threatening kind of a situation it there are some life threatening situations where you need blood transfusion but by and large 90% of the cases blood transfusion is not the answer okay so don't be uh, afraid ki oh my patient has hemoglobin of 2 gram so let me just first transfuse you will be harming the patient you may harm the patient you will definitely disturb the blood picture and you will never get the correct answer to the underlying etiology so 
don't rush for a blood transfusion no matter how severe the anemia except for a few situations i'll let you know investigations should always flow from the history and exam okay there are situations where you don't need any investigations for example a patient has come with a massive upper gi bleed you don't need any investigation you don't need any serum iron or ferritin or anything okay so always look at the history and exam and then the investigation should follow uh, lastly what i have realized is there are a lot of automated counters these days coolers and all that don't rely just on an automated counter they give 30 different parameters 25 of them i still don't understand uh, i just understand the hb tlc dlc and platelet count beyond that is all uh, over the head transmission even for me so if you don't understand talk to your pathologist but always insist on a good quality peripheral blood smear exam done by a human being okay these are the broad principles now when approaching the patient first we must decide uh, whether the anemia is part of some underlying disease okay this will be very very apparent for example if the patient has chronic kidney disease chronic liver disease some ma malabsorption obviously malnourished patient some infections nephrotic syndrome malignancy drugs okay so here anemia is part of the underlying disease and the particular disease may cause anemia by multiple different mechanisms okay like decreased production in the marrow increased destruction of rbcs in the blood sequestration in the spleen loss from the body okay so that depends on each different disease but if that disease is obvious then the anemia is part of that disease okay and you then you treat the disease and the anemia will get treated so that is one next if there is no obvious underlying systemic disease which is seen or found then you can think of a primary hematological disorder means something is wrong in the blood or the marrow okay so here we are dealing with things like hypoproliferative anemias something is wrong in the marrow the marrow is not producing enough rbcs the hemolytic anemias aplastic anemia leukemias lymphomas some malignancies which are metastasized into the marrow or the myeloid dysplasia where the marrow becomes dysfunctional now why in these diseases you won't find too many signs or symptoms in the other organs or the other systems of the body apart from say like lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly okay so but as you know the lymph nodes and the liver and spleen they are part of the hematological or the reticular endothelial system only okay so these are the primary hematological disorders so as i said earlier there are two approaches to anemia the most of the books or the chapters or um, the traditional teaching which goes on is the pathological or the pathophysiological approach okay where you you sort of start with the peripheral blood smear then you decide whether it is microcytic normocytic macrocytic then whether it it is a hypoproliferative anemia or a hyperproliferative anemia then accordingly you stratify and you find out okay that is the classical or the pathophysiological approach but it is very very different from a clinical approach now in clinical approach this method the pathophysiological method is also used but it is used after a clinical evaluation both the approaches are complementary okay so the path pathology or the hematological approach will complement the clinical approach but isolated either of them cannot give the answer but still clinical picture is most important and uh, the reason is that the pathology of anemia or the underlying cause can be multifactorial uh, and mixed pictures are much much more common 
in uh, real life you can get uh, very confusing pictures or confusing reports from the pathologist most commonly which i have seen is uh, a dimorphic anemia it's a very irritating term nine out of ten peripheral smears will come back as dimorphic anemia it is not their fault the but the point is that it leads me nowhere okay it doesn't tell me whether it is a microcytic anemia or a macrocytic anemia it just tells me it's a mixed kind of a blood picture okay so what i'm trying to realize is that the pathophysiological approach cannot be followed in isolation it has to be interpreted in the clinical picture in the patient that you are seeing so rare rarely we get typical megaloblastic anemia picture with uh, macro ovalocytes with uh, poly segmented hyper segmented neutrophils or typical iron deficiency anemia with target cells and pencil cells we rarely get those pictures it's always a mixed kind of picture so uh, and the other problem is that expert and dedicated pathologists are needed just to you know report a good peripheral smear whether regardless of whatever investigations they have uh, the there are very very few pathologists who can report a peripheral smear uh, nicely very few and uh, uh, when i was doing my residency we had a very good pathologist and he used to report these uh, peripheral smears very very nicely and we practically made all our diagnoses on the peripheral smear and we did not need any other investigations so if you can make good friends with the pathologist ask them to see the peripheral smear nicely discuss with them uh, lastly never rely solely on a coulter report that i have already told you coulters are just fancy machines so now going on to the syndromic approach uh, so the first syndrome is a rapidly developing anemia within few hours to few days for if the patient was normal just few days or few hours back suddenly something happened and you find him in the er with severe anemia or with anemia so the conditions obvious conditions are trauma some uh, with some external uh, bleeding and internal bleed is not visible say in the abdominal cavity or in the chest cavity then obvious acute bleed non traumatic like a ruptured esophageal varices gi bleed missed abortion you know they can pour uh, abrupt show placenta they can literally pour like a tap then you have spontaneous bleeding diathesis with all your bleeding and clotting disorders okay and then even your hemolytic anemias they will be very very rapidly uh, develop developing anemias and uh, patients will come to you in a crisis okay so that is the first syndrome so rapidly developing anemia then the second uh, syndrome is a more of a long drawn or a chronic kind of a thing the anemia in systemic diseases and these are as i said usually multifactorial you cannot ascribe one uh, pathology to the underlying cause for example in the earlier one you could see that trauma bleeding it's all bleeding bleeding and hemolysis single pathophysiology in these cases there are multiple pathophysiologies for example in chronic kidney disease in chronic kidney disease you have platelet dysfunction which can lead to bleeding you have erythropoietin deficiency which can lead to hypoproliferating you may have some blood loss okay because of drugs you may even have marrow hypoproliferation because of ckd per se okay again chronic liver disease uh, especially due to alcohol it can lead to b12 deficiency it can lead to marrow suppression can lead to blood loss due to esophageal varices so the point is that these the anemia in systemic diseases is usually multifactorial okay and you have to approach the treatment in two ways one treat the underlying disease 
and second correct the cause of anemia for example in alcoholism the treatment is to stop alcohol but the treatment of anemia is to give b12 and folate okay then infections acute infections chronic infections malaria kala azar hiv chronic viruses tb endocarditis malignancies can cause anemia by blood loss nutrient deficiencies cachexia bone marrow hypoplasia and then the well known entity anemia of chronic disease anemia of chronic disease can be seen in all of these conditions here the body does not uh, the body is not able to utilize the iron stores in the marrow because of the chronic inflammatory state and that leads to a hypo proliferative marrow and but the blood picture is a normocytic normochromic picture the third syndrome is when you see an elderly person or elderly patient with anemia here you should be very very uh, cautious because you are dealing with uh, something uh, very sinister and first think of malignancies without doubt okay even before iron deficiency or b12 deficiency even if you have diagnosed iron deficiency why iron deficiency again think of a malignancy blood loss from the colon the lung for example in squamous cell carcinoma or persistent hemoptysis bladder ca bladder blood loss hematuria lymphomas cll cml aml then as i said myelodysplasia distinctly disease of the elderly above 60 70 okay the marrow will have a mag, uh, will have a dysfunctional marrow okay some all three lineages may be affected the erythroblast the myeloblast and the thromboblasts some will be producing more some will be producing less you will get a macrocytic blood picture plus minus other cytopenias but this macrocytic blood picture will be accompanied with a normal b12 and folate so elderly person macrocytic picture cytopenias normal b12 folate immediately think of myelodysplasia okay then it is not uncommon to see malnourished neglected elderly people uh, and they have other diseases tuberculosis or some other chronic disease and they are just malnourished they just need good food okay so now the other extreme the anemia in young patients by young i mean the even the elder older children or the adolescents here again malnourishment worms again top the list especially in india and especially if they are coming from a low socio economic status importantly we must not forget in this age group the inherited or the genetic diseases which can cause anemia okay so if you know them then you will think of them then you will know okay what is the presentation of sickle cell anemia so repeated sickling crisis alpha or beta thalassemia so patient will have anemia jaundice splenomegaly chipmunk facies okay then autoimmune hemolytic anemia then uh, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency hereditary spherocytosis elliptocytosis and membrane defects like pyruvate kinase then if a child has other severe systemic diseases then then there is simply a failure to thrive okay which again will lead to malnourishment and anemia so the point is when you look at elderly people think of these when you look at an anemic patient who is young think of these okay the fifth syndrome is an anemic patient also having jaundice okay so here again think of hemolytic anemia as number 1 where you have recurrent episodes splenomegaly mild lemon tinge of jaundice gall stones and a family history okay for example hereditary spherocytosis which is autosomal dominant okay then chronic liver disease they will have both anemia and jaundice hepatobiliary malignancies they will have deep direct jaundice conjugated weight loss pruritus cachexia and bleeding due to vitamin k deficiency because there is fat malabsorption due to obstructive jaundice 
then b12 and folate deficiency can also present with some anemia with anemia and jaundice okay that is a very very common presentation of b12 deficiency anemia and mild unconjugated jaundice a special uh, syndrome is hemolytic uremic syndrome or the thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura just remember whenever you see anemia thrombocytopenia and hemolysis and renal failure these four things which one anemia thrombocytopenia hemolysis and renal failure then you think of hus or ttp okay and the characteristic blood picture is known as the maha blood picture microangiopathic hemolytic anemia blood picture then certain typical infections we see very very commonly in india leptospirosis the severe complicated malaria and the rickettsial infection the scrub typhus okay and infective endocarditis infective endocarditis will also present with anemia jaundice so this is the fifth syndrome so anemia with jaundice think of these things now then if you have anemia with other cytopenias that means anemia with leukopenia with thrombocytopenia or anemia with leukopenia or anemia with thrombocytopenia okay so that means the defect is not only in the erythroblast it is there in the uh, leukoblast or in the thromboblast also the megaloblast also so again commonest cause which we have seen is b12 deficiency or folate deficiency so b12 deficiency characteristically will present with severe anemia thrombocytopenia leukopenia pancytopenia okay they will have some unconjugated bilirubin raised they will have some splenomegaly and characteristically they will have the dark pigmentation over the knuckles and the dorsum of the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints when you see this picture it is b12 deficiency give b12 patient will respond within few days then chronic alcoholism again it can cause pancytopenia due to bone marrow suppression due to b12 malabsorption okay acute leukemias multiple myelomas they will all replace the marrow and they will cause cytopenias leukemias can have high blood counts but they can have a leukemic or sub leukemic leukemias where the leukemia blasts in the marrow will be will increase so much that they will uh, crowd out or they will compress the other the normal lineage cells and no cells will be produced by the marrow except for the leukemia cells and similarly advanced hodgkins lymphoma and non hodgkins lymphoma can also um, uh, invade the marrow and cause an uh, marrow hypoplasia then uh, aplastic anemia where the uh, the the progenitor cell in the marrow is destroyed by an autoimmune attack and uh, therefore none neither the rbcs or the wbcs or the platelets all three lineages will be affected and reduced and you will typically what is taught to you will be a dry marrow dry bone marrow tap and when you do the bone marrow biopsy you will see the massive uh, replacement of the marrow by fat cells then a very characteristic uh, syndrome is the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria so if you see a patient with anemia who also has evidence of hemolysis also has evidence of some history of some red colored urine off and on especially in the night and has some history of some deep vein thrombosis in the past okay then you must think of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria okay uh finally there are some infections which can cause anemia and cytopenias primarily by either by depressing the marrow or by causing lysis of the cells in the blood you have severe sepsis due to any cause severe malaria advanced hiv kala azar tuberculosis 
we have seen so many cases of disseminated tuberculosis not just in the lungs but in the brain in the abdomen and in the marrow and it is just like the, the granulomas are just replacing the marrow and the patient uh, is not able to produce any rbcs and uh, so they come with severe anemia okay then systemic fungal infections again replacement of the marrow another very important uh, class of patients are the immunosuppressed patients okay these patients have hiv cancer steroids chemotherapy bone marrow transplant diabetes t or b cell defects chronic rheumatic diseases and they usually suffer from opportunistic infections like cytomegalovirus parvovirus epstein barr virus fungal tb then they can also develop secondary malignancies like lymphomas and skin tumors they uh, can also uh, cause anemias they can also suffer from malabsorption because of bowel surgery for example for crohn's or or c e colon then they can have a lot of gut dysbiosis you know the gut flora is disturbed because of chemotherapy or steroids that again will lead to malabsorption if they are given radiation that can lead to radiation enteritis and finally big culprit are the drugs with a lot of chemotherapy drugs which can cause bone marrow suppression so whenever you see immunosuppressed patients like hiv patients of cancer patients on long term steroids transplant of cpnt especially renal transplant you will see lot of patients these days patients of malignancy who are on chemotherapy and if they come with anemia then uh, uh, you have to think either of opportunistic infections most important or drugs okay finally don't forget these three diseases these are often forgotten these are three endocrine diseases which can very very commonly present with anemia and if you don't know if you don't think you will never investigate you will never find them and then you will never be able to treat them hypothyroidism then addison's disease and hypopituitarism if you, you must look if you don't have any other cause if the patient doesn't have any underlying disease no cytopenia has no immunosuppression no family history no hemolysis no infections no malignancies then always consider endocrine diseases look for the features in the patient of any endocrine disease and if you have the slightest of doubt then you must look for them by doing the appropriate investigations Okay, and anemia, mind you, is a very, very prominent part of all these three diseases. So, of the investigations, if I have to tell you just one investigation, it has to be a good peripheral blood smear exam. Nothing else. If you have seen your patient carefully, if you have taken a good history, if you've done a good examination. and if you have discussed the case with a knowledgeable senior which is most important then i can personally guarantee you that you can reach the diagnosis 95% of the times with just a peripheral blood smear you don't need any other investigation no serum iron or ferritin or endoscopy ha you may need them to confirm your uh, doubts or your suspicions but you will find that more often than not you you will be right so just a good peripheral blood smear costing 50 rupees is the best investigation because a, a good operator can even tell you the hemoglobin level from a good from a peripheral blood smear you no know, tnc and platelet so definitely you find out from the peripheral blood smear but a good operator can even tell you the hemoglobin 
so if you have your hemoglobin level if you have your tlc if you have your platelet if you have your abnormal cell morphology if you have your uh, um, all these things just from a peripheral smear there is very little else left to do okay still the other things which i feel are important are a reticulocyte count now the reticulocyte count cannot be checked on a simple peripheral blood smear you require a supravital staining uh, so that is why you require a separate smear and uh, you can look for it if you are suspecting something like a a plastic anemia or a hemolytic anemia where you will find that the reticulocyte count will be very high basically a reticulocyte count which is high is telling you that your marrow is not diseased okay your marrow is fine so the cause of anemia in a patient who have who has an appropriately raised reticulocyte count is not in the marrow it has to lie in the blood itself either by means of destruction or the patient is not or the patient is losing blood okay so it's a it's an important investigation if you get a raised reticulocyte, reticulocyte count or a normal reticulocyte count similarly it can be used to monitor the response to treatment in hypoproliferative anemias due to iron or b12 deficiency you give iron and b12 and even before your hemoglobin rises your retic count will jump so that is that means your marrow is responding that means your marrow is normal and that also means that you are on the right track okay then if you want to confirm diagnosis of iron deficiency you can do a ferritin or a transferrin saturation but remember ferritin is a slightly tricky investigation it is uh, an acute phase reactant so a simple intramuscular injection can also raise the ferritin level so even in iron deficiency anemia the ferritin can be high if the patient has malaria okay or if the patient is receiving uh, injections of streptomycin for tuberculosis treatment because they are given intramuscular so that doesn't mean that the patient does not have iron deficiency anemia okay. so be little careful when you are interpreting the ferritin yes a low ferritin definitely means iron deficiency but a normal or a high ferritin does not rule out iron deficiency then transferrin saturation is low in iron deficiency and it will be normal or high in other causes like anemia or chronic disease then a uh, serum b12 level can be done if you are suspecting uh, a b12 deficiency in a case of macrocytic anemia the one advantage of getting a b12 level done is that you can avoid a bone marrow examination and uh, but the other uh, important uh, thing which i have learned about b12 level is that the level uh, for example the laboratories give a range from 200 to 900 picogram per ml roughly the important caveat to remember about b12 is that b12 deficiency or a functional b12 deficiency can happen even at a level of 250 or 300 picogram per ml you don't have to wait for the level to fall below 200 okay so a b12 deficiency severe b12 deficiency with a megaloblastic anemia with subacute combined degeneration of cord can also happen with a normal serum b12 level so if your b12 level in the patient is even like 250 even 300 but the clinical picture is typical like i said macrocytic anemia with uh, you know some splenomegaly some little jaundice 
and pigmentation over the knuckles and proximal interphalangeal joints, then it is B12 deficiency. And then even if your B12 level is 250 or 300, just go ahead and treat. And you confirm it with your reticulocyte count. Your reticulocyte count initially will be slightly low because of the hypoproliferation, but the moment you give B12, the marrow will start immediately, the factory in the marrow will start and the reticulocyte production will increase within five days. So you check the reticulocyte count on the fifth day, it will jump to 20%, 25%. And that means you are right. Then whatever investigations, other investigations all depend upon the disease which is under suspicion. If you are suspecting malabsorption, then you look for the cause, for example, celiac disease or Crohn's disease. If you are suspecting malignancy of the GI tract, then you do a colonoscopy or an upper GI endoscopy. So that all depends on what disease you are suspecting. Okay, so I told you we will talk a little bit about when to do a bone marrow exam. Why, why am I so insistent on this one investigation? Please remember, the moment you tell a patient that hum tumhari haddi ke andar sui guser ke vaha se khun nikalenge, vaha se pani nikalenge, 9 out of 10 patients will refuse. You think yourself, if somebody tells you this and you know what happens in the marrow, how will you agree to it? And if you have to agree to it, you will make sure that it is required. It is not being done just to complete the uh, formalities. So it has to be done with a lot of thought because it is a painful procedure. It is dangerous, especially if you do it from the sternum. It should not be repeated. You know, you cannot tell the patient after seven days, Ki, oh, ho, wo to kharab ho gaya. Abhi karna hai. it pains very much. And, and then you should not regret it later on, Ki, yaar, uska to hi nahi tha. I could have diagnosed it just by a simple serum B12 level. So I could have diagnosed iron deficiency anemia. Ya uska stool analysis may worms dik jata. Ya cyst overcyst dik jata. To make you karta. So think 10 times before doing a bone marrow. Why are you doing it? Could you do without it? How will the uh, report of the marrow change your management and if you have gone ahead with it then make sure that you do it very very properly and then carefully send it to the lab and then discuss it with the lab discuss it with the pathologist yeah, this is the problem and this is what I am expecting okay and one practical tip, always ask the pathologist to preserve the slides for review later on. Okay, we have seen so many patients who have got their marrow done outside, they come to us and because they don't have slides, so we have to do the marrow again. And what we have sometimes done is that once we have done the marrow, we found that patient has leukemia or something else. Sometimes we have even given the slides to the patient. Okay, take these slides, go to some other cancer hospital, get yourself treated there. So that is the amount of uh, thought that has to go into a marrow exam. Okay. So when do you do it? Only if you are suspecting any hypoproliferative anemia without any obvious cause. For example, no iron deficiency, no B12 deficiency, no drug, no tape tuberculosis infiltrating into the marrow. Okay, then if you're suspecting malignancies like leukemias, lymphomas, plasma cell dysplasia like multiple myeloma. In fact, for a multiple myeloma, also you don't require a bone uh, marrow. The only, re the, the, you can just diagnose a myeloma based on your uh, the serum protein electrophoresis and the uh, other, the crab, the four crab features hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and the 
bone pain and the serum immunoglobulin levels. So even for a plasma cell dyscrasia, you don't require it. Then for disseminated infections, which you are not able to diagnose by other means, non-invasive means, myelodysplasia, yes, definitely. Aplastic anemia, yes, definitely. And myeloproliferative disorders like chronic myeloid leukemia, essential thrombocythemia, uh, you need it. For polycythemia, Vera, the primary polycythemia, you do not, Mark, you do not require a bone marrow exam. The best investigation now to diagnose a polycythemia Vera in the appropriate context is a JAK2 mutation analysis. Okay, that has replaced your marrow exam for a primary polycythemia at least. Okay, so these are the few conditions where you need to do a bone marrow exam, not otherwise. Okay, so what are the broad principles of treatment of anemia? So obviously, if an iron deficiency, give iron. If B12 deficiency, give B12. But that is not enough. What is the cause of the iron deficiency? Treat that also. If it is blood loss, where it is coming from? Stop that blood loss. If the B12 deficiency is due to worms, treat the worms. If the B12 deficiency is due to uh, uh, this thing, celiac disease or Crohn's disease, treat that. If it is due to pernicious anemia, then obviously it cannot be treated. But then you have to give lifelong B12 replacement. Hematinics have to be used very judiciously. Don't uh, overdo with the hematinics. And uh, again, don't transfuse blood if it is not indicated. As I said earlier, uh, you are exposing the patient to infections. Believe me, in still many parts of India, even within urban areas, there is a lot of uh, wrong things going on with the way blood is collected and it is transfused. Blood is still sold and bought very openly without any checks. So infections do happen and uh, even if the properly collected blood is not stored properly then also there can be bacterial growth within that especially in platelets and that can cause infections then transfusion reaction mismatch transfusion reactions uh, even if nothing of that sort happens then you are still exposing the patient to uh, somebody else's blood and you are only matching for abo and rh you're not matching for the other blood group antigens so you are still causing a degree of alloimmunization and this can be detrimental to the patient when for example supposing if the patient has to undergo some kind of transplant later on okay if the patient is already alloimmunized then there is a high chance of rejection of that transplant then the cost cost is quite substantial and if you just tell the patient ki, okay tumhe do botal khun chadega jao do aadmi dhoond ke lao it's not easy then if the patient has thalassemia you have not seen thalassemia you don't know then you transfuse iron uh, transfuse uh, blood you are causing iron overload so that also is a wrong practice only transfuse if the hemoglobin is less than 6 gram per cent and there is some acute urgency slash emergency for example acute coronary mi heart failure brain failure renal failure active bleeding pregnancy shock okay don't transfuse blood uh, just because the relatives are saying or just because it is a very low level okay many many patients will tolerate a very low level very well okay they might have some dizziness fatigue some dyspnea that might be there definitely but if they are sitting they are fine okay so these are the only conditions where you must think and then transfuse blood okay now 
finally we will talk about some of the pitfalls and the pearls in evaluating anemia when you see a patient of acute bleeding don't rely on the hemoglobin level as a measure of the anemia it may be falsely high okay because the uh, intravascular compartment is depleted and there is uh, the it has not uh, been equilibrated and uh, so the hemoglobin level will be falsely high so don't use that to judge the level of anemia you instead you should rely on the amount of blood loss okay then always be aware of non visible or occult or hidden bleeding from the gi tract the urinary tract or the genital tract okay so always get if you're not getting any other reason for anemia and there is definitely iron deficiency that means patient is losing blood and so in such cases if there is no history of blood loss then do a fecal occult blood test do a urine examination to look for rbcs okay and get a gynae evaluation done uh, to look for any cervical vaginal or endometrial disease then third very important thing in a patient of copd polycythemia or cyanotic heart disease anemia is diagnosed at a higher threshold and let me be very frank i was not sure but i thought it is 12 so i mentioned it 12 but you should check it okay like for normal population the who defines it as less than 10 okay but for these three categories of patients who are supposed to have a higher hemoglobin level which is the normal for them anemia has to be diagnosed at a much higher level and not at 10 okay now for example primary polycythemia patient the usual hemoglobin is 20 g percent so for them 10 g percent is way way too low for them 12 g percent is for them uh, uh, 10 g percent is just like 6 g percent for a normal person understood so there the hemoglobin level has to fall to only about 12 to call it anemia or for them to decompensate or have symptoms so this is another important thing so if a patient of copd has come to me and i find that their hemoglobin is 10 for me that is severe anemia or a patient of tetralogy of pallet has come to me and i find that that boy's hemoglobin is 10 so he is severely anemic okay then what are the pearls so never ever forget to think or ask about the following things medications aspirin is a very notorious cause and nsaids these are both of these are very notorious cause of upper gi bleed from um, gastric erosions and ulcers okay anti epileptic drugs especially phenytoin and carbamazepine they can cause marrow suppression anti tubercular drug especially inh can cause sideroblastic anemia so always review the entire prescription which the patient is taking think whether this drug can cause anemia in any way think whether this drug can cause blood loss can suppress the marrow can cause hemolysis any drugs cause hemolysis okay and that is how they are discovered the patient is taking ciprofloxacin and patient has developed anemia with some jaundice and you find patient has g6pd deficiency okay then always keep in mind toxins lead arsenic mercury out of these lead very very common once in 6 months or once in 3 months once in 4 months we come across one case of chronic lead poisoning not acute chronic lead poisoning as the cause of anemia okay because lead is a very very common component of many uh, alternative medicines it is found in many uh, professions in occupations okay and 
it is very very uh, commonly uh, the humans are very commonly exposed to it uh, then complementary and alternative medicines are very very commonly used in india they are a very common cause of anemia especially ayurvedic medicines always ask the patient are you taking any ayurvedic medicine are you taking any home remedy are you taking any medicine from a non allopathic doctor okay especially any chinese herbal medicine any medicine ordered on the internet you know these days on internet you can order anything you can even order components for a for an atom bomb so chinese herbal medicine and ayurvedic medicine are all available so always ask whether you are taking any medicine whether you got anything from the internet then whether the patient is taking any weight loss medicines many weight loss medicines are available and they can cause anemia so always explore complementary alternative medicine use then as i have already said occupation and environmental exposure so ask the occupation of the patient and not just the current occupation ask all the previous occupations and even in that occupation ask what was the exact role of the person and whether that person was using any protective equipment or not gloves face mask uh, any protective clothing boots okay so all these things are very important for the evaluation then if you have anemia with this particular combination of low albumin hypocalcemia diarrhea pain abdomen always evaluate for celiac disease okay celiac disease is very common i would say that there is a term known as occult celiac disease in which the patient just has some anemia and that to an iron deficiency anemia because celiac disease predominantly affects the absorption of iron in the jejunum uh, in the duodenum and the proximal jejunum so if you have iron deficiency anemia just that no other cause the albumin is normal calcium is normal there is no diarrhea there is no pain abdomen there is no weight loss and there is no other cause and you give iron to the patient the patient will improve the moment iron is stopped anemia will reappear and there is no blood loss there is, there is no blood loss in the stool no urinary blood loss no hemoptysis no no genito urinary loss so where is the iron deficiency happening it is happening because the iron is not getting absorbed in the duodenum and jejunum because of celiac disease so these are the cases where you must evaluate for a celiac disease just get the antibody levels done the iga and ttg levels if it is raised then you can get an upper gi endoscopy done so that is called occult celiac disease they will just present with iron deficient refractory iron deficiency anemia so there are three causes of refractory iron deficiency anemia one celiac disease two h pylori disease and third ongoing blood loss okay so whenever you find that there is iron deficiency anemia which is refractory to treatment that means you are giving iron patient is either not improving or once improving again deteriorating then think of these three things lastly always keep in mind worms malnutrition menorrhagia and multiple pregnancies never forget these four things in our country so iron deficiency anemia deworm okay the moment you find patient is losing weight not eating enough food think of malnutrition menorrhagia in women always take a history and even even in post menopausal women take a history of post menopausal bleeding the multiple pregnancies rapid okay 
so these are the things which you must always keep in mind and uh, i think this is all that i had i have two case vignettes for you i will read them out a 62 year old man attends the nephrology clinic he is ckd stage 4 due to diabetic nephropathy hypertension ischemic heart disease and previous duodenal ulcers he reports feeling tired he has poor quality of life is unable to do anything because of absolute exhaustion but there are no other systemic symptoms you review his blood tests which show so and so so if we review the stem it says that the patient is elderly number two patient has stage four ckd number three patient has ischemic heart disease and number four patient has a previous duodenal ulcer so i already have four causes for his anemia one is elderly so i might be looking at some kind of malignancy or myelodysplasias then ckd stage 4 so i'm already dealing with a systemic disease ischemic heart disease patient may be taking aspirin or clopidogrel which is causing gastric uh, bleed and uh, blood loss and duodenal ulcer which again can cause blood loss patient has quite a lot of symptoms okay so again from this stem you see that in a given patient anemia of 9 gram percent is not caused by a single entity it can be caused by multiple entities okay now you have to decide what is the cause of anemia in this case now if you just have a look at the investigations the mcv is fine so that means it is unlikely to be a microcytic hypochromic anemia so iron deficiency anemia looks unlikely which is corroborated by your normal ferritin and your relatively normal iron saturation okay again the b12 level is also pretty okay but if your mcv was something like 110 or 115 then with this b12 level also i might consider b12 deficiency so folate again folate is also fine so i am not looking at any kind of hematinic deficiency either iron deficiency or b12 deficiency or a folate deficiency okay and there is no suggestion of any blood loss but his urea and creatinine is quite high and he has a normocytic normochromic anemia so what is the and obviously it doesn't look like a malignancy also because there are no other systemic symptoms so we take it that patient does not have any features of malignancy no other symptoms so what are we left with we are just left with a stage 4 ckd as the cause of his anemia okay so that means the cause of anemia in this case most likely a hypoproliferative normocytic normochromic anemia due to erythropoietin deficiency caused by his advanced ckd and so the treatment for this gentleman will not be blood transfusion will not be iron will not be b12 will not be folate it will just be giving erythropoietin and once you give erythropoietin his hemoglobin will improve his symptoms will improve okay so this was one illustrator now the second one i will read it a 62 year old man attends the nephrology clinic or i think it's the same man his background is ckd stage 4 uh, he's the same man okay so now it's the same man same disease now the hemoglobin is 8.8 .8, mcv is also fine sodium potassium urea creatinine is high egfr is also will be same everything is same so what test would you perform next to investigate the cause of his anemia okay so the answer here is the options here are b12 folate iron study the erythropoietin level endoscopy or a colonoscopy which is the fourth choice now obviously c and d i can exclude because i'm not looking at any blood loss or any microcytic hypochromic picture okay erythropoietin level is only done if you are suspecting a polycythemia to rule out whether it is erythropoietin dependent or erythropoietin independent 
So that leaves me with B12 folate and iron studies. Now, mind you, the reason I'm doing B12 folate iron studies in this case is not because the patient is B12 iron or folate deficient, which is causing anemia, but like in this case, I told you he has to be given erythropoietin. So the caveat before giving erythropoietin is that if the patient has B12 folate or iron deficiency, then the erythropoietin will not work. Why will it not work? Because the erythropoietin has to go and stimulate the erythroblast in the marrow. When it stimulates the erythroblast in the marrow, the erythroblast will divide and multiply and grow. So for all these things, they require what? B12 folate and iron. So if there is no B12 folate or iron, or if there is less of B12 folate or iron, those erythroblasts will not grow, divide, and mature properly. Okay. So the learning point here is that when you have to give erythropoietin, your B12 folate and iron should be normal as was seen here. The B12 was normal, the folate was normal, the ferritin and iron saturation were all normal. That is why. I could rule out the deficiency and that is why the I could give erythropoietin here. Otherwise, if these are deficient, then first I have to correct these and then I have to give erythropoietin. Like in this case, so I don't know what are the levels of these investigations. So here the anemia is again due to a chronic kidney disease stage four, but before giving erythropoietin, I have to make sure that these three things, the B12, folate and iron are sufficient in the body. Then only I can give the patient erythropoietin. Okay. So this was the second case vignette, just to illustrate to you the principles which I've just taught. So I think that is the end of my lecture. I don't have any more slides. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to advise you is that you read it and if you have any questions, you can all send them uh, to Priyanch. Uh, then Priyanch can compile them into one single uh, word document. Then he can mail it to me. I will write down all the answers and I will mail it back to Priyanch and that common document can be shared amongst all of you. So if you have 20 questions, all of you will come to know those 20 questions and their answers. Okay, that will be a very informative exercise, learning exercise. So I will advise all of you, if you have any questions, just you can WhatsApp them to Priyanch. And Priyanch, you make a common word document and send it to me. Uh, I am also compiling two or three uh, documents of reading list. Uh, some nice articles and I will mail them to Priyanch and then he can disseminate to you so that you know uh, you can read a little bit further and uh, learn a little bit more about the clinical approach to a patient of anemia. I am really sorry uh, this is a very uh, one way kind of communication and I have I am aware of all this and um, but I, I can't help it. And uh, so the only way for us to communicate is by the question and answer mode. And I think you can send them, send the questions to Priyanch. Uh, so is that okay, Priyanch? Uh, shall we end the session? Is it okay? You can uh, uh, WhatsApp to me, Priyanch. Hello. Hello, Priyanch. Okay, then I think uh, if uh, I think then what I'll do is I will end the session here and uh, that's it then. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a good day. Bye.